surprises. Um, in terms of learning new things every day, major surprises. Um, I guess the biggest surprise is we thought we had three dozen Joseph Smith legal cases and we have 200. That was a surprise. These are judicial proceedings. They're not all full-blown court proceedings, but nonetheless, 200 in uh, the short life he lived is pretty amazing, and you have to just wonder how he got anything else done. Um, can you please give some of the current church history that is an error that will be corrected by means of the project? Oh, there are so many interesting little details. Let me just give one that we're dealing with right now, and we haven't even sorted it out, so I can't tell you where we'll land. But we all know Doctrine and Covenants section 107. That's, uh, that was published in the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants. Back then it was section three, and it was called On Priesthood. We don't understand very well how it was put together. It's different than most of the revelations. They, most of the revelations are, Behold, thus saith the Lord, the text, amen. This is a different kind. It's more like section 20. So how it originated is an interesting story. I wrote a dissertation about Brigham Young and the Quorum of the Twelve. I know that revelation. I know the setting for the revelation. I've used it. I, it's very important. I haven't answered that kind of a question for myself before, and we're looking at it. But the other thing is, it's been, since the history of the church dated it this way, dated 28 March 1835. That doesn't work. If the setting that the, church, the history of the church gives for that date it's the wrong date. That is, if the setting that gives for the uh, meeting where this uh, originated is correct, the date doesn't work. If the date works, the setting is wrong. Because we know where many of the 12 were on that day, and it wasn't in Kirtland, they were somewhere else. That Joseph himself that weekend was somewhere else. So there was an error in the minutes that the history picked up, and when we're done, we'll redate that sometime after 28 March, possibly 28 April, and uh, has to be before March, the, May the 4th, when the 12 left. So day after day, we have those kinds of things where we have access to resources that Willard Richard and his staff didn't have. They had access to things we don't have. They could ask people that lived through it. But uh, together, I think we're going to end up with a better understanding. Will the work be indexed, cross-reference, database searchable? Uh, yes, yes, yes. We... <laughs> Another question is, will it be on the web? We will have all the content on the web one day. Uh, the one day is being sorted out, what that means. <laughs> um, but clearly the church has an interest that this be accessible to Latter-day Saints and to others freely and openly. Uh, some of the other projects do too, but not all. That is, the University of Virginia has an electronic edition called the Rotunda which is subscription only to get access to all these materials. We will not have subscriptions and they will be all there. The indexing is crucial. A lot of our people have been to what's called informally Camp Edit. It's funded by the NHPRC. It's held every June in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. John Kaminsky of Madison is one of the major figures that helps train documentary editors. And his mantra is a book is a, a documentary editing book is only as good as its index. It's a reference material. If you don't have ways to get into what you've done, how can anybody use it? So we have right now three full-time people working on indexing volume one. And that will be in draft form by the, by the end of this month. It will be reviewed and upgraded if necessary. And it will be, um, we hope, a model of indexing for this kind of work. And every volume will have an index and they will all be searchable in other ways on the web. Uh, how much will we be able to learn about Joseph Smith, especially as scribes? There will be many discussions with documents as the project unfolds about the role of the scribes. We've identified scribes we didn't know before. Uh, we've known for a long time that Joseph didn't write much in his own hand. It's mostly as scribes. But you will be able, at the end of the day, to know who these scribes were, you'll know about them. Let me just give you one example. Revelations 1, that will be published in the first quarter of 2009, doesn't have what 
our standard biographical index. What it has is a scribal directory. And each of the major scribes that are in these Revelations manuscripts has an entry saying, here's who he was, here's the characteristics of his handwriting, here's how we've transcribed it. So you will know a lot about the scribes. And they were very important. And one of the reasons Joseph Smith had great records is because of his scribes. One of the reasons we have less than we wish we had is because of his scribes. <laughs> Warren Parrish apostatized. James Mulholland and um, um, Robert, not Campbell, Thompson died young. Uh, very difficult time keeping good scribes at work. When Willard Richards, in spite of being a doctor, arrived in Nauvoo, in early Nauvoo, and began in December of 1841 working for Joseph Smith, we, we got a continuous record, the best we'd ever had, that carried through the rest of his life. Willard Richards gave a great, uh, dedicated service to that. Uh, our papers being made available for this project that were previously unknown to the church. Uh, we are finding things we didn't know before, private collectors that have them and have been willing to share, uh, materials that were in our own holdings that we didn't have good control of that we've been able to sort. Most of the documents are generally familiar outside the but they're scattered about. Um, 